for today's episode of Breaking the Biz, an informative podcast where we dive into the world of entertainment by interviewing seasoned professionals who have made their mark in the industry, gain invaluable insights as they share their personal journeys, offering advice on navigating the dynamic landscape of the entertainment industry. Whether you're an aspiring actor, musician, filmmaker, author, animator, or any creative soul, Tune in for expert career guidance, insider tips, and first-hand accounts on breaking into the entertainment industry. Get ready to unlock the secrets behind successful careers and fuel your own passion for the limelight. Please remember to like this video and to subscribe to our channels for more great conversations. Greetings from Breaking the Biz, brought to you by Yes I Can, Unity through Music and Education. I'm William Felber, your navigator through the intriguing universe of the entertainment industry, as revealed by the visionaries and creators who bring it to life. Stay tuned as we delve into diverse insights from the forefront of entertainment, hearing from pioneers, creators, and agents of change. Prepare for a journey filled with tales of innovation, resilience, and the undying quest for artistic brilliance. Welcome to Breaking the Biz podcast with the Yes I Can crew. Uh, we've got a great uh, show for you tonight. We have Ryan Reger, who is an entrepreneur, an author, and also a radio show host. Uh, his journey of entrepreneurship started in November 2008 after managing an unsuccessful political campaign. Uh, he basically didn't want a real job. His dream was to be able to work from home with his wife, Melanie. Uh, that opportunity came in the form of an online furniture business. Uh, Melanie and her mother-in-law started a very part-time online furniture company back in 2005. And Ryan saw it as uh, a shot of having his own business with the Lord's help. Uh, they did over 250000 in sales in 2009 just on Craigslist and just in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Soon after that, they started shipping furniture nationwide and expanded to Amazon and eBay. In 2012, we learned he learned about uh, Amazon's FBA program, Fulfillment by Amazon, and that set the trajectory for the next several years. Instead of heavy furniture, they focused on smaller items that Amazon could fulfill, uh, primarily focusing on wholesale and private label products uh, that were crafted out of their own brand. Um, on top of that, Ryan's passion to help others start and grow their own business led to him writing books, creating courses, and speaking. Uh, they now have 16 different streams of income. I can only imagine that. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, in April 2017, uh, he had his son. Uh, and again, being blessed to be able to work at home and not miss a moment of his life due to these various streams. Uh, since the end of 2008, he's not had what we would say a real job. And he mentions you can do the same as well with uh, finding streams of income, which breaks down to three main ways of making money online. Uh, in short, an easy read. Uh, you can read his book, which will kind of give you some insight, hopefully tonight. Also, you'll get a little uh, some teasers and some pointers as well. And he can point you in the right direction to kind of tap into the resources that you already have or need to fill, fulfill uh, your dreams. So, Ryan, on that note, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Brad, it's my honor and privilege. Thank you so much for having me. This is so cool. And I love this. So this is an actual podcast, too. I love it. <laughs> Pod, podcast. And you've got uh, the next generation of creatives on this call uh, looking That's just awesome. to find exactly where they're going to land in the entertainment industry and taking that knowledge and insight and figuring out how they, too, can have 16 streams of uh, income uh, to just tap into yeah. what they're passionate about and let their passion That's become so a awesome. paycheck. Well, guys, thanks for being on this, and I'm just honored to have the opportunity to talk with you. Melissa Hughes just raved on and on about the opportunity here when she was on a couple of months ago, and so I'm excited. Yeah, let's do it. Go. Let's do it. So um, let's talk about your your education path. What was your yeah. education path? Did you study business, entrepreneurship? Yeah, I guess. Let's talk me through it. That's hilarious too. Yeah. I didn't, st didn't do business at all. If I had to go back, I probably would do business. Um, so I went to a graduate high school. I'm, I'm from Indiana originally moved to Texas in 2008, but, um, went to a small little school called Huntington university. And I was a, uh, history major. 
uh, I was interested in political science and they didn't have a political science major at the time. So I chose history because that's what they said was, you know, you'd get some a lot of history and you get a lot of political science classes in that. So that's what I did was a history major and went into uh, government service, served for a couple congressmen and senators and lo absolutely loved that. But I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. Um, and so I just, uh, but yeah, history major and that has nothing to do with what I'm doing now. I do love history. I enjoy learning about it, but it, absolutely nothing uh, that, that I did for education wise would point you to think that, you know, I'd be doing what I'm doing now. And that's totally fine. I mean, there's lots of times where we start our educational path and we think we're going to go in one direction mm -hmm. and there's curveballs, there's different roads ahead. Uh, yes. What made you want to get into politics? Oh, gosh. Um, I think I was in high school. Um, I I remember, guys, this is going to tell you how old I am, so forgive me here, but um, I remember very uh, vividly the 92 campaign. Um and it was, uh, I was a sophomore in high school and just being involved in that and caring about, caring about that. In 1988, I remember what happened too, but I was a little bit too young to vote. Um, so I actually really honestly, Brett, it goes back to, I remember being like in studying in school, the 88 primary, um, uh, and it's, it's, that intrigued me, like these guys running for president and what all that meant. And then, um, in 92, actually getting a little bit involved and then also, we got the. I remember my junior year of high school, I had the opportunity to attend a town hall meeting for our local congressional office. And it was the congressman himself that came and answered questions from constituents. And I got to be there and meet the guy. And I thought that was amazing. You know, just little things like that, that I think are highlighted to me that like, wow, that's cool. This guy gets to live in DC and he gets to do all this. And that just, in, there was, it comes from that. And then also had the tremendous opportunity to intern in Washington, D.C., my the junior year, my junior year of college uh, for the one semester anyway. And so that solidified it. And guys, I could tell you, like, if you have a desire to do something, I mean, being involved in this program is getting you hands on access. But that internship right there, um, I mean, school is important. Reading books are important. But I learned so much more on that internship, like living in D.C. for a whole semester. I was able to work for a senator's office, be in the office as an intern. I wasn't getting paid, but I saw the ins and the outs. I was there almost like a staff member. They relied on me like a staff member, and that kind of solidified, like, I want to do this. And so right after I graduated, I went back and worked in that same senator's office, but this time as a paid staffer. So that experience, Brett, was very valuable, just being around it. Um, so if you guys have desires to do something, man, go work for somebody for free just to see if you enjoy it, uh, because that uh, really set the tone for me. You know, and it's it's interesting that you mentioned that, right? Like an internship is a great opportunity for you to learn the verbiage, to see exactly mm -hmm. the ins and outs like you mentioned. Um, yeah. There's more to than an internship than just getting coffee. And, yes. uh, you know, you were like the staff member there. Uh, mm -hmm. You loved it so much that you went back in and actually got hired and, and worked. Yes. Um, so, again, a, a great plug for internships, especially when you can have a paid internship and there's no risk at yeah, all. That's even better if you can get paid for it. I didn't get paid, but I did get college credit for it, which I needed anyway. So kind of got paid, but. Yeah, no, that and you know, it, you mentioned college credit, college. but also that experience uh -huh. is uh, learning is 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 priceless. So you Absolutely. can't always put a, a a cost on you know. But uh, again, you don't have to struggle as much when you can make sure you're paying your gas and and exactly. your way while you're learning. So right. you worked, and uh, you mentioned the campaign was not uh, successful. What did you learn yeah. from from the loss? That was a sometimes we talk. So after working, um, after being an intern for a while in '97, I went to back to DC to work um, for that same senator in '98, and then um, he retired and went to work for a guy in Congress in '90, most of '99. Um, he ran for governor. He lost that race. Um, I worked to him with him on the governor's campaign. But from 2001 to 2007, I worked for another congressman in the district office in Indiana. The campaign that wasn't successful um, was the one I managed, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I was the boss of that campaign, campaign we lost, so I'm 0 for 1. Um, but we, we 
<laughs> after that, that's when I moved to Texas and uh, went full into entrepreneurship. But that was the yeah, it was the 08 campaign in Southern Indiana. Okay. So 08, we definitely had a very uh, crazy market, lots of crashes and a very yes. hard time on, on the economy. Um, not to say that, you know, losing it's like, all right, I'm done, but you right. know, for one on the campaign, but you know, moving is moving and, and, and so, so be it, maybe you moved on. Right. Uh, let's, let's talk about entrepreneurship. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you mentioned always interested in entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, being your own boss, making your own rules, making your own time. You have to be extremely dedicated in order to be successful as an entrepreneur. Obviously, I don't have to tell you, you've got 16 uh, income streams and I, I can't wait to get into that. So you moved to Texas. Talk me through um, what you do to make money. Yeah, uh, well, it's changed so much. Like it's, uh, it it totally is different than what I when I started. So as you read in the, the bio, uh, we moved here and I didn't have a job. And so I wanted to, I desperately wanted to do my own thing. Um, and when, especially when I saw the furniture business that my wife and mother-in-law had already started very part-time, I thought that's the opportunity, but my wife said, no, you need to go get a job. So we, we made a deal that I would go and, and look for a job, but also at the same time working on this business, all it was, we were posting ads to Craigslist and we had a wholesale source of furniture. So we could post ads without having any inventory. So there was no risk involved uh, other than my time of posting ads. We'd post ads for a certain piece of furniture. If it sold, I'd go pick it up at the warehouse, pay for it, take it to the customer's house, and they would pay me, and I'd make profit. So it was as simple as that when we first started. Um, we did that for a few years. We had a store for a year. Um, and then I actually, we sold that business in 2013 and went mostly on just on Amazon and eBay for smaller items, actually mostly Amazon. They have a program called Fulfillment by Amazon where you can ship things to them and they'll store it for them, for you. Uh, so we did that for several years, but then Brad, I, you know, with you to teaching people and training and mentoring folks, I, I really fell in love with that piece of it. Um, I'd have people with, since with running a successful Amazon business, being involved in the communities I was involved in on like Facebook groups and, going to live events, people would ask me questions. And so I just loved pouring into people. And so in about 2013, I wrote the, our first book and then have written several since then, um, teaching people how to make money online and specifically Amazon was where I started. And then we, um, I don't know how deep you want to go. You stop me at any time, but then we, no, I want to go, I want to go deep into, uh, yeah, I want to go deep into it. Let's stop at sure. Amazon. So yeah. uh, Amazon had first started, obviously, you know, most people know Jeff Bezos and and, and with selling books and, and creating it out of the garage. Uh, at some point he realizes or someone in that entrepreneur uh, Amazon team goes, hey, other people should be able to sell their products underneath the umbrella right. of Amazon. Yeah. And I'm imagining that's where the AMS fulfillment comes in. Yeah, their FBA fulfillment comes into that. You can be a third. I mean, anybody on this call right now, if that this sounds remotely intriguing to you, you can be an Amazon seller. They allow third-party sellers. And so we would um, buy things either um, our two main, well, we actually had three main ways to sell physical products on Amazon. Our first was with whole, was wholesale, the furniture that we had access to. We started selling furniture on Craigslist or on Amazon, started on Craigslist, then went to Amazon and eBay. Uh, but by going to home shows and these furniture shows, we got access to other sources of, of items and we, we were able to buy wholesale, you know, decor and all kinds of knickknacks. Uh, and we would buy those wholesale and sell it retail on Amazon. Also a whole other business model we got into was private label. We had our own brand of mattress protector for a while, did really, really, really well with that one that paid our mortgage for several years. And then, um, also retail arbitrage, which that's what we ended up teaching to all the, the courses that I created. Um, most of the students were retail arbitrage students were literally walk into any, you know, you guys out in the West Coast have Ralph's. So you could walk into a Ralph's grocery store and find things there that you could flip on Amazon for a profit. And so we had major success with getting students financially free, getting them out of their job with the retail arbitrage method of sourcing from their local stores and flipping them on Amazon. So that's really what we taught. And that's really what excited me. Because honestly, Brett, Amazon doesn't excite me. I don't even care about Amazon. Um, 
it, it bores me to honestly to talk about getting deep in the details of this is how you create a listing and all that. There's way smarter people than me for that. Um, what I love about it is that it's a vehicle that literally anybody can create a very significant income from. And I can teach somebody how to make money on Amazon, even if they have no experience and no money to start whatsoever. So it's a very easy business to get started. It's work. It's hard work like anything. But I love that it's a it's a great vehicle. And just the success stories that we're able to produce, just that's what it puts a smile on my face is seeing people be successful. People that never done business before, now able to quit their jobs, bring their husbands home, bring their wives home uh, to be able to be with the family. That's the stuff that excites me. And Amazon just happened to be the vehicle for it. Okay. So you write your first book and is your first book predominantly on the Amazon model and, and it was, selling yeah, online? It was called Real Wholesale Sources. It was just a, it was a very niche, very, very, I mean, nobody on this call would want to read it. You'd be you'd, you'd crying because it'd be so bored. Um, literally, it's just about, it just pro, it was just how to source wholesale products. And it was a list of wholesale products that were online sources. And honestly, it's probably so outdated because I don't even know if that site exists anymore. But the power of that, like, here's what happened real quick is I, this is why networking and relationships are so important. So I had, before writing that book, I had got in touch with and managed to maybe have a friendship with a guy named Jim Cockerham, who has a very large Amazon uh, podcast, email list, and community. And so he and I became friends. And when I told him about this idea that I stumbled upon this site for wholesale sources, I'd like to write a book. I, um, he loved it and said he would promote it. I had no email list whatsoever. He has a big email list. So we made a partnership, which I wrote the book. He emails the, he promotes it to his list and we split the profits 50, 50 guys. I did. We sold thousands of copies of a $7 ebook, just $7. But I think we sold like maybe three or 4,000 copies. And so do the math, $3, if I made $3 and 50 cents and on a three, 3,000 units. That's, I made almost, you know, nine or $10,000 on the little ebook. And so that was like, oh my gosh, you know, what I have up here is valuable. I can actually teach this stuff and it changes people's lives and helps them out. And also I can just create partnerships with people like Jim. And now eventually I created my own email list and build it up over time to where I was able to do those types of things too, which is super fun being able to help other people like that. But so all to answer your question, it was Amazon focused. The first three books were all Amazon focused. And let's talk real quickly because you brought it up. How important has networking been yeah. in, I mean, I imagine 16 streams, there's a lot of networking that is involved in that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it really, I would not be here if it weren't for the the people I've met, the relationships, the just the partnerships that have come along. Um, like I, I don't, I mean, entrepreneur, you might think that you can be an entrepreneur or solopreneur and do it on your own. And you can, to a certain extent, go at it alone. You'll be able to create a ne decent business. But there's so much power with partnering up with people, learning from other people, going to conferences and meeting people. Uh, like Jim and I have done so much business together just because we have that relationship. Um, you know, when I came up with other things that I wanted, that, uh, new products, he wanted to promote them. He promoted my membership community that grew to 500 people paying $197 per month. He was a big part of that um, and was our, my biggest affiliate, but I also had a business partner with it too. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Brett, it was, it's a business is relationships in my opinion. There's just no way to, to get around it. Okay, so after you do the three books, what comes next? Yeah, so after the, um, the third book was a private, it was called Private Label the Easy Way. And it was about how to find, um, a, you know, how to, I, I took a course that taught you how to do private label products. And it was, it was teaching people how to source overseas. And so the problem was that the mattress protector I wanted to create was a $10 cost and you needed a thousand units to get started. So that's $10,000 out of pocket before we even know the product was going to sell. So real quick story, I was uh, we selling furniture. And so we bought mattresses from a local a mattress supplier, actually a mattress factory here locally. And I went to the guy who I was buying mattresses from and asked him if they could create and, and manufacture a mattress protector for me so I could put it under my brand. He said, we could, but it would be way cheaper if you just go over to Dallas and buy these wholesale ones that are already being imported. 
So I made that phone call and just said, hey, can we buy your mattress protectors? Can we take your, because they had this branding card in the front of them. Literally, you zip open the mattress protector. Um, you pull out the card with their brand in it. We, ha- we went on to um, uh, some online print shop that made it super cheap that we could print our own, put ours in, zip it back up, and send them off to Amazon. They're like, we don't care what you do with it after you buy from us. So like, oh my gosh, this is like a, the biggest loophole in private label history. Um, so I, I wrote a book called Private Label the Easy Way and taught how to essentially use wholesale suppliers to become your private label supplier because everybody's teaching if you want to have a private label product, you have to source it from China or India. And that's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But for a, you know, just a small little seller like my wife and I, we we didn't have that kind of money just to, oh my goodness, let's let's spend 20 grand and hope this product sells. If it doesn't, that's my friends and family are going to be getting mattress protectors for the next two years for Christmas. Um, so I just heard so many horror stories about that. So Private Label the Easy Way became our first membership community where we wrote the book, but we went further. So this is where the multiple streams of income comes from. The book was a stream of income. The book is not a, even at the time, wasn't a huge stream of income, but it was what turned into that was taking that. And this is guys, even if you, anything you, you hear from, you're like, I don't care about Amazon. I just want to turn this guy off. This is boring. It's listen to the, just because the, the path I went on is applicable, no matter what the topic or the niche. Um, I took the content of private label, the easy way, which was a book and the exact same content, we turned it into a course which turned into a membership community that people paid for to be a part of. It turned into one-on-one coaching. It turned into live events. We did live events just based on that that one topic of private label the easy way. So the same exact content can be sold in multiple ways because people will read your book and they'll be like, that's great, but I want more. So that's where the course come in. That's great, Ryan, but I want more. So that's where the mentorship community came in, where it was a group where people could ask questions 24 seven and get their answers. And it wasn't just me and my business partner doing it. it. Was we had other people that were that knew their stuff at the time, that were read our stuff, learned from us, and now they're experts. And so they're helping us manage this group, and we're getting paid for this group. And then we had live events, exact same content pretty much. But people will pay for access to you. People will pay for one-on-one coaching because they need their hands held. Um, some folks will read a book and go do it. Most folks will read a book and don't do anything at all. The folks that do the work are the ones that get into your course. So we took that same concept of the private label stuff and it turned into multiple streams of income for just that same topic. That can be done in literally any niche. It's amazing. So, you know, for for those uh, on the call that are, you know, wanting to be video game uh, creators and animators and script writers, you know, I hope you're taking this in and going, how can I get multiple streams? Um, you know, and it's interesting. You mentioned some people read a book, don't do anything. Some people read the book and then the ones who do read the book and, and, and want more, uh, that's where that membership comes in and makes complete total sense. And then one-on-one coaching, uh, mentorship is absolutely important. And, um, we heard from another entrepreneur, you can never get advice from someone who has not actually lived it or, mm-hmm. or, or did it. Uh, uh, so entrepreneur, uh, mentorship is absolutely valuable because no one understands the risks and you, and the other thing that this other entrepreneur said, and it's interesting cause you kind of mentioned it too, is an entrepreneur is very smart at not taking financial risks. They know exactly yeah. how to maneuver. And that mm-hmm. kind of goes hand in hand with what you just talked about with yeah. Do I want to have 10,000, uh, you know, comforter, uh, yep. you know, sheets, uh, covers, uh, or is there a better way of doing that? And yes. it seems like you have figured out all of the different ways to maximize the money and do it smart and not risk. I'm sure yeah. family is really in, loving the fact that they can get other gifts uh, come Absolutely. the holidays and not, and not yes. uh, mattress covers. Brett, with the way it is now with the entrepreneurship, you don't have to, there's, I really believe like most of the days are gone where like, you know, you and your wife walk into a bank and we're going to mortgage our house to start this business and just hope and pray that it does well. With the internet, you literally can start oh, many businesses on a shoestring budget, almost free sometimes just to test it out to see if it will fly. And, um, 
and there's nothing wrong if it fails. Like failing, I, I like failing because it just means that I'm, you know, I can go on to the next thing really quickly. I want to fail fast. If I, if I we try something new, um, it may cost hundreds of dollars or or free in many cases to test this out. And if it doesn't work, a oh, big deal. We'll try it a different way or do something different. Um, it's it's never it's always a learning experience when you fail uh, when a business doesn't work or a new idea doesn't work and what you you were saying there's some folks on here that are script writers so one thing to think about guys just an easy way to think about multiple streams of income if you're doing something for somebody like you're a freelancer you're writing scripts you're creating uh, oh gosh I don't know music for a, a film or anything like there's also but here's an example I have a friend who uh, her name is Elise Bowman. She is a voice actor, and she um, is the voice of Pan from Dragon Ball Z, I think. Um, I'm not an anime at all. I don't know anything about it. But she um, obviously gets income from that, from doing the actual work. But then she also started a voice acting school or a core. It's an online program where she teaches other people how to be voice actors, how to get jobs. And so anybody that's listening here, you already doing, you're doing voice acting. You're doing something that your people are paying you for your time. Well, you also would probably be able to, I guarantee you will be able to take that same skill set and same knowledge and be able to teach that to somebody else and get paid for teaching them how to do the very thing that you're doing. So you got to, a done for you option where you're you're doing the doing the work, but then also you have the opportunity to teach other people how to do it and make money. So that's a way to make two streams of income from essentially the same thing. Love it. And you mentioned we, we we're talking about obviously mentorship is valuable. People pay for mentorship. You're obviously yes. paying it forward. We appreciate that. Who was your mentor? Who who kind of oh you know came in and was yeah. you know. Hey, Ryan, you should try this, or I see you're on to sure. something, but tweak it like this. That's good. Uh, yeah, everybody has a mentor. You should have a mentor if you don't. Um, so Jim Cochran for sure was a mentor to me, is a mentor to me. Um, he's a little bit older and just has more experience and have been has been in the online game for longer. So Jim was totally that person. Also a guy named Dan Miller who just literally passed about you know three months ago. Um, Dan Miller has a podcast called 48 Days to the Work You Love. A uh, wonderful man. Uh, definitely learned a lot from him. He's uh, like 70 some years old and so about my dad's age. And so just, uh, I, I don't know, it doesn't have to be, the person doesn't have to be older than you, but I've always gravitated to people older because they just got more life experience than me. Um, so yes, mentors guys are key. Find people that are doing what you want to do and just get around them. And you know, you will find out that most successful people are very generous. They want to help. They want to give back. They want to, if you invite them to lunch or coffee, a lot of them are going to say yes, because they're just going to be honored that you want to, you know, do that. And they're, um, they're very, very uh, generous with their time. I love it. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to just point out is you mentioned failing, you learn from failing, but mm -hmm. there's a benefit to failing fast yeah. and knowing when, when in, do you know the idea is not working and it's time to, you know, give up. Cause we talk yeah. about resiliency and how important yeah. that is. And there's been many people, you know, we think about like JK Rowling, who, you know, uh -huh. was trying to, to pitch this Harry Potter idea and, and all these yeah. publishers are saying no. And she stuck to her guns till finally someone said, yeah, Harry Potter, this sounds like a cool idea. Let's, let's see, let's let you put this book out. Same yes. thing with Stephen King, you know, like mm. it, nah, we're not getting it. It, it. it is, you know, when, when do you know it's time to walk away from the wow. idea, start mm. something new, or when do you stick to your guns and keep going? That's a good question. I'd love to, man, I probably could hear your guys' thoughts on that. Cause that to me is hard to know. Um, so like I'm, you know, Colonel Sanders has a similar story where he had so many no's before he was successful. I think most of the ideas I have, like that I'm failing fast, aren't aren't like the thing that I feel I'm called to do. I'm a man of faith, and so I, I pray and read my Bible, and I just you know feel like God leads me and directs me. Like if it was okay, here's here's my answer. This may not be what you're looking for, Brett, or it would be helpful to folks. But like if it was something that I know in my bones, I know, and I, this is what I'm called to do, and I know that I'm supposed to create Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I have a good recipe, and I just know this is good. Well, 
I, I think I would stick it out. Like it, with my wife, for example, we had a long distance relationship and there were times when we'd go back and forth and like, she was like, I don't think you're the one for me, but I really knew that this was the one I stuck that one out. Cause I, I just knew like this was going to happen for most of these, these little ideas that I have. They're not like, Oh my gosh, this is the idea that I have. That's going to change the world. These are just like small little things like, Oh, this could be cool. Let's try it out. So those little things we'll quit those very fast. Like, you know, we might give them a couple months to try it out. So I think that I would, it depends on what the idea is. What do you really feel called to do? If it's like, you know, you're a JK Rowling and that's your life's work and you just know that's what you're supposed to do. Man, you stick it out as long as you possibly can and never give up. But most of the stuff we're doing, it's like, you know, hey, these aren't these aren't the thing. It's just like this could be another stream of income that we're going to test out. I don't know if that's helpful or not. All no, it's it's absolutely helpful. And, and obviously, if you got that KFC recipe, you keep grinding <laughs> until, right? until someone's absolutely. buying your chicken. For sure. Give and me you, a probably, time. you guys can probably also think about a lot of actor stories that are like this. I've heard people like Jim Carrey who took forever to, to get his first job and wrote, took, had a $10 million check he carried around in his wallet. Um, heard that story. I mean, and he visualized being able to cash that someday. And, um, but yeah, look, I'm glad he didn't quit. Cause he's hilarious. He's one of my favorite actors. <laughs> yeah, no, there are times where you just have to manifest it. We just had a guest speaker who talked about, uh, sometimes you have, plan a some people like plan b and c but if you don't even think about b and c and you just stick to a you're yeah. gonna do a yes. or you're gonna find a way to do something a minus uh right exactly. but you know you don't have to go to the b and c if you right. want it that bad so correct um i want to ask you when is the time that you had to be adaptable or pivot or change Oh my gosh, like all the time. That's what entrepreneurship's about. I imagine, I mean, just reading what you've done with this this nonprofit, right? I can't imagine this had been all, oh, this is great. Let's do this. And it's been all, you know, roses all the whole way. Um, guys, being an entrepreneur is a, is a roller coaster. Some days you're like, this is the greatest thing ever. I mean, most of the days I love it. But there's some days you're like, man, no sales are coming in. Or just you, you read a review on a book and it's like, oh man, that stinks. Like they didn't like my book and you take that wrong. And you want to quit and give up and just go get a regular job. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, you know, I, I work for myself and I can call the shots. And that that to me, the time freedom for me, having we have a six year old, he'll be seven next month. I mean, that makes it all worth it. Um, so, yeah, well, I'm sorry. What was the question? again? No, no, no. That. It, that That's perfect. And that's absolutely, a, a you know, you mentioned entrepreneurship is being able to adapt and being flexible. And, yeah. uh, and even I can when tell you you're many following... stories of examples of how to do that, because they're just it happens a lot. And there are some time there's some that are more like, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really glad that we pit, were able to pivot there, because if we didn't, we wouldn't even be in business anymore. There's those types of things, too. And it's interesting too. I mean, even thinking back to like Craigslist, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm right with you with the, with the Craigslist and, in you know, trying to figure things out even prior to, uh, to the internet, but obviously yeah. the internet just made things so much easier mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, expanding. Um, Absolutely. we have somebody in our circle who uh, figured out how to sell, you know, furniture and get it from China, similar to what you're talking about, that That's wholesale awesome. price. And then yeah. get it into Office Max and, you know, all of those wow. stores and kind of created a, a, a pretty good uh, financial, uh, you know, story for himself. That's awesome. um, I want to know what is your next thing that you're kind of working on right now that you're extremely excited. Obviously, yeah. you do the books, you do the mentorship, you yeah. you do the classes. What's next yeah. for you? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, honestly, I sold a, a lot of my um, what's not in that um, in that bio because uh, it happened just in last May. But I sold the Amazon business, that mentorship program to one of my students. Um, and so right now I'm working on um, AI software for language translation. I've got a virtual assistant business. Uh, these are folks in the Philippines that we um, we connect with businesses here in the U.S., uh, so I love that to me, it's a ministry because it allows, you know, I can create jobs over there for these folks that are so hardworking and, um, their moms and dads that, uh, you know, that want to work from home and be with their family. Like we all do and being able to work for a company here in the U S allows them that opportunity. So I have that business. Also we have with Melissa Hughes, who was on, um, she and I are partnered up with some other folks on a, 
company called Kingdom Dreamers Media. And it's um, um, for nonprofits and ministries to grow their social media, help them with podcasting, really help them grow their nonprofit however they need. So um, those are the three big things that I'm actually working on now. I still have the books and things that are selling and that stuff that in the background. And also, guys, when you say 16 streams, that doesn't mean like these are like 16 large streams of income like you know the legends group that i had that was the mentorship community that i sold that was a, the that was a very large stream of income but like for example real whole self sources that first book i wrote i mean i still get a little bit of money on amazon every month from that so that would be more like a trickle. Now I might, you know, still include something like that in my number because it is a stream of income. It may be buy me coffee every month, but so it's not like you know, I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, this guy's got sixteen streams of income, and you know, she's he's you know got you know twenty million dollars coming in every month. It's not like that. <laughs> but no, totally to understood. Live, live here with my family. I can be home with my son uh, and my wife. And I'm honestly living the dream because I don't have to go to a job that I hate every day. And there's a, most guys my age are fighting traffic, going to a job they don't want to be at. No, and that's and that's the whole point of this program is to have individuals find exactly what it is they're passionate about. Maybe yes. it's something that they've wanted to do. They just didn't know how to get the foot in the door, how yeah. to necessarily start. Um, so having someone like yourself who is successful and is willing to take those risks, um, that's what the inspiration is. That's what gets somebody to figure it out and go, okay, you know, I've got my art. How can I maximize yeah. on my art? How can I, you know, what my skill set, what can yes. I do? Um, let's talk about your radio show. Yeah. So it's, I, I so here's, it, I still call it a radio show. It started out as a radio show in Dallas for, we had it for several months, but I, it's a podcast now. Um, most people, I have a lot of friends that have podcasts. They call them radio shows. So it did start on the radio. It's in Dallas. It was in Dallas on those three stations. But then after a while, I'm looking at the numbers that I'm spending, like, man, I'm seems like I could do just as well with making this a podcast only. So I made that transition, you know, five or six months into it. Uh, but it's called Streams of Income. It's a it's the same content as my book. Uh, well, it's, I talk about some of the same content, but I have folks on all the time. I love interviewing people and interviewing successful folks in real estate, online sales. I mean, I've had uh, Melissa has been on three times and just that's fun for me because here's another tip. That podcast has gotten me the opportunity to be in front of people that I never would have had the opportunity to meet otherwise. So I almost see it like I love having downloads. I love that I get downloads. I love that people listen to it. But even if I didn't get any downloads, Brett, let's think, for example, that I had some type of um, you know program I wanted to get to people who were in the entertainment industry, some type of course or book, and I wanted to get on the radar of folks like this. Well, I mean, having you on my program allows me the opportunity to get to know you because maybe we become friends and maybe you know if we get rapport and you like what i'm doing you may decide to promote my stuff it just i don't come at it from like hey i'm trying to get anything but i'm giving that person the opportunity to be on my stage and who knows what can happen after that so i've just had the opportunity to meet some really cool people through my podcast so even for that alone it's worth it just having having those connections uh, and it's fun i enjoy doing it. i've been doing it for four and a half years I love it. And you're absolutely true. And, you know, sometimes our individuals go, man, networking is so hard and it's uncomfortable. And most people, when they think of networking, think it's like going to uh, the drinking hour with uh, the right. business cards and walking around and almost like speed dating. And it's not yes. that. I mean, just right. like you mentioned, uh, having a podcast, building rapport, uh -huh. meeting people, learning from people. Yes. Um that that's value right there. And that is, Absolutely. you know, and I like how you mentioned, it's not like you have these, like, I'm going to work with this person or, right. you know, we're going to create the next something on, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, right. but organically things like that do happen. Um, yes, obviously indeed. Melissa connecting, you know, to, to you mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, you know, Melissa's thing of like posting a TikTok video and then waking up in the morning and millions of people and I breaking know, the crazy. algorithm and, you know, like, uh, that, that, that absolutely is a, is a crazy story, but yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's true. Um, uh, networking yes. can be absolutely uh, a very natural thing. For sure. Um, talk me through, is there a mantra that you kind of see yourself saying each day or keeping you focused or a positive one or Gosh. anything? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, uh, for for me, um, you know, my I read my Bible about every day, and there's a verse in John 17, 4, it says, um, I have glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail the work you assigned me to do, and it's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to the Father. Um, and it's that's my life verse, Brad. It's I, I like, I know... Um, and guys, if, if you're not a believer, that's totally okay. This it just, it, it doesn't matter, but that that's how I get my, I'm my motivation. Awesome. <laughs> um, and so I just, um, the I, I believe that he has called me to do this. Um, he's given me the opportunity to have this stage and it's an honor and a privilege. And so I really, and, and even if you're not a Christian, I know that you guys are people that you like, you want to, you want your life to mean something. You want to leave it all for like a, you know, football analogy. You want to leave it all on the field. I want to leave it all on the field. I don't want to sit on the sidelines of life and just hope, watch people do what they're doing. And I'm just a spectator. I love the entertainment industry and I love what you guys create, but I wouldn't want to just sit in my couch and watch TV all day. Like I want to be in the movie. I want to be doing stuff. And so that's, for me, that's what it is all about. Like, did I do what I feel like God's called me to do? And if I can say yes at the end of that, then I'm successful. Love it. Beautiful. Tell me a time that you stepped out of your comfort zone and found success. <laughs> Gosh, all the, well, and the found success part is not <laughs> step out of my comfort zone. That's, that's what entrepreneurs do every day almost. Um, well, I mean, when I, when I lost the campaign uh, and we started, the easiest thing would have been to go get a job when I when I moved here to Texas. That's I I knew what jobs were like. Uh, entrepreneurship was new to me. I you know I had a desire to do it, but never really been an entrepreneur up to that point. So that was scary. We had just gotten married, and like, what? How am I going to feed my wife and I? Like, I hope this works, but I have no idea if it's going to work. I really knew that that's what I wanted to do, and I was hoping that the Lord would bless it, um, and I was being obedient. Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, the furniture business ended up being very successful, but that was a scary road guys. I'm not going to tell you that, Hey, entrepreneurship is all fun and it is fun, but it's scary. But, you know, I think it's just as scary to go to work every day. And, you know, because, you know, at any point you, you could, you know, get called to the boss's office and, <laughs> and be, uh, be fired. So it's, to me, it's, it's not any riskier necessarily than a regular job. It's just, I get to control, you know, what I can control, um, so, but yeah, there's many times I've, I've stepped out. Sometimes I fall flat on my face, but other times I've been successful and that was a good decision. Those are, those are the ones where we fail fast. Exactly. You just get picked, you just pick back up and go on guys. That's what you do. <laughs> I love it. What is the biggest piece of advice you would give to a younger Ryan with all that oh. you've learned, all that you've accomplished? Wow. Um, just start. I feel like um, a lot of people I talk to, um, they, I want to do this. I want to do that. I, um, someday I want to be this. Well, there guys, there's no reason you can't start doing that now. There's, there's not really, uh, most of the people I talk to that want to start a business, uh, a lot of times they just never do it. They don't get it. The times aren't right. The stars aren't aligned. Well, it's never, ever, ever going to be perfect. So if you have something on your heart that you feel like you're supposed to be doing, to even just take a baby step and and just do something every day towards that goal and you'll get there. But so just, I'd say, just start, get going, do something. Uh, my uh, Dan Miller, who just passed away recently, he would say, follow your curiosities. So it, you guys are all young. So it doesn't mean like, oh, if I step out and, and try this, that that's what I'm going to be doing the rest of my life. It's okay to test something out and decide six months later, you know what, this, this, does, this isn't it. This doesn't feel right. You can pivot, you can change. There's, you've got so much life ahead of you. Um, and just try stuff. If you're interested in something, talk to the people that are in that field, uh, read books on that, take courses, do your research on that field, uh, be an intern if you can, or if it's a business type of thing, just start a small business and see what it's like. Most of the time, like we were talking earlier, you can start businesses online with almost no money and see if there's any, if there's any traction there before you like quote, go big on it. Uh, it's, it's very easy to test ideas now in, in this age. I have uh, one last question that I'm going to open it up uh, to uh, to the crew here. Sure. Um, when you said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, you know, yeah. obviously the wife said, you got to go get the job. Right. You said, oh, I'll look, but I'm, yeah. I'm just going to kind of, you know, make moves here and, and 
generate generate income uh did your parents go what you're gonna be an entrepreneur you should be a doctor you should be you know a, you know, a awesome dentist a lawyer no my parents are um very my dad passed away in early uh, just in, two, in 2022 january 2022 but they were so supportive of me so um no they did not do that or say anything like that they were supportive and they loved what i've I, mean, I don't know if they didn't say any, if they didn't love what I do, they didn't say it. Um, but they've always been supportive of me. And uh, so, no, I did not. Thankfully, I had parents that are, you know, super supportive and, you know, have always been positive on the thing. I love it. I love it. You know, because most people go, oh, you're going to be an artist. Ah, you know, you're going to be the, sure. str the struggling artist. And, um, you know, we had when when we had the entre the entrepreneur on our show, uh, he was talking about you know when he went to USC and was in the entrepreneurship program. It was in the basement, and then wow. uh, individuals like Mark Cuban and you know as entrepreneurship is kind of a little bit cooler now. He goes that program is in the top floor, and you know it, it's just kind of shifted how people respect entrepreneurship a little bit yes. differently now. So absolutely um, makes sense. Ryan, I want to thank you for uh, making time for us. I know an hour out of your day is an hour away from uh, making moves and, and working oh. on, uh, uh, on different ideas. I love the things that you're working on. Uh, continue the, you know, the good work, um, being able to travel, be with family, be your own boss and make your own time. I want you guys to also understand, yes, Ryan has that ability to be his own boss and to do what he wants to do, but that doesn't mean that you can slack off. You know, mm -hmm. if you are an entrepreneur, uh, just like he mentioned, the hobby is working. You have to be able to have time management, executive functioning skills, and uh, there's a lot of pressure when you are um, your own boss. But there is also a lot of beauty to being your own boss, as Ryan mentioned. So, uh, Ryan, thank you again for your time, continued them. success, and I most definitely will reach out offline and, and yeah, we'll have to do. collaborate for sure. For sure. Happy to help you guys with anything you need. This is so cool what you're doing, Brad. I'm just uh, an honored that you had me come. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one and enjoy that family time. I know right. I know uh, the boys ready to do the video games right now. So and get he's to going to bed now. So that's uh, good. even better. <laughs> that's right. More time Thanks, to work. Guys. That's right. <laughs> Have a blessed evening, everybody. You got it. Right back to you. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye. 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 everyone. As we conclude another enriching episode, we hope you've found inspiration in the stories shared today. Let's take a moment to honor Yes I Can's role in bringing Breaking the Biz to life. Yes I Can's commitment to empowering young people with disabilities through education, advocacy, and mentorship shines brightly, paving paths of opportunity and dialogue. This podcast celebrates the organization's dedication to nurturing talent and facilitating impactful discussions. Breaking the Biz is more than a podcast. It's a part of Yes I Can's broader mission to amplify voices, dismantle barriers, and craft a world that's more inclusive and accessible for everyone. Each episode is a chapter in our shared narrative of progress, education, and empowerment, driven by the spirit of Yes I Can. Thank you for spending your time with us on Breaking the Biz. Continue to challenge the status quo and share stories that resonate. Until our paths cross again, let's keep transforming aspirations into achievements and infuse every endeavor with optimism. Here's to advancing the landscape of the entertainment industry one episode at a time. I'm your host, William Felber. See you next time.